gonna watch you bleed. Um, that was an incredible uh, opening intro. Uh, thank you, Jill Petrachek, for designing that incredible um, image that you all saw. And then Mr. Clinton Trucks, secret GM Clinton Trucks, can you hop in here for a second? My man? I'm just wondering, that music, <laughs> yeah, that was you, right? That's you. That was me band. on that mandolin right That's there. your band. Yeah, it was yeah. just you on mandolin with, I mean, there were after effects added. Sure, sure, sure. I have a lot of layers. Yeah. Uh, well, it's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful work. Uh, really you, wonderful. I, I was trying to uh, get the blood pumping, set the tone, and now we settle in with a snifter of brandy for a fireside chat. That's right. My blood is pumped. Uh, I've settled in with a, a big glass of water because the <laughs> pandemic is over and I can no longer have whiskey uh, on a Tuesday anymore. Um, <laughs> that's a personal 16 journey. 16 months of whiskey on a Tuesday. Right. That's a, over. That's my personal journey. You at home, uh, of course, uh, you choose your beverage of choice. And you you do what you will. Um, I'm so excited for tonight. Where you know, Taste of Blood is all kinds of things. It's it's usually games, but tonight it's a little something special. Uh, what do we have tonight uh, for our viewers? By the way, this is the stream of Blood, where we usually play tabletop role playing games here on Twitch. But tonight we're doing something a little different. It's called a fire side chat. And Clinton Trucks, who do we have to speak to tonight? Uh, we're very very fortunate to have the designer of. Uh, a lot of games that I enjoy, but one that we have been playing here on the stream and uh, really one that has become like almost everybody's favorite thing we do on a weekend, uh, yeah. Blades in the Dark. Blades in the Dark. So, so we have the uh, designer of Blades in the Dark, John Harper, here with us tonight. And uh, we couldn't be more excited. Before we dive into our interview with John, I just want to remind people that we survive. We serve, we, we feast on your subscriptions. So uh, if this kind of uh, content, if you are enjoying our, by Clint, if you're enjoying our shows, if you're enjoying our games, please subscribe on Twitch uh, and uh, uh, buy a subscription for someone else you see that doesn't have one. Uh, that's something that you can do on Twitch too. It's kind of a cool little feature. Um, and uh, let pe more people know about the stream of blood. The more subscribers we have, the more content we're able to bring you, uh, like tonight's interview or like our uh, our once a week blades games. Um, okay, so without uh, further ado, I'm going to give a little preamble for our guest. So uh, before I, I'm going to I'm going to say all this so when he's not out here, so he doesn't have to, you know, uh, blush. Uh, basically. Um, the game Blades in the Dark, uh, and uh, in addition to his other designs, but Blades in the Dark is really the one. Uh, this game is a game that kind of hit me uh, from a direction I wasn't expecting, and um, I suddenly realized that um, it is, uh, and I don't want to blow too much smoke up up. Our, our friend's ass, but I, I got to be honest, like this is none of this is, is made up or, or me just being effusive because I have to interview the man. Uh, it, this game, A Blades in the Dark, might be the best tabletop role playing game in 20 years. And I've played them for 20 years, so I have an opinion on that. Um, it really kind of reinvents uh, how these games work in a way that is fun in a way that solves many of the kind of little problems that these games sometimes have. Um, and uh, it sort of just creates an entire new paradigm in the tabletop role-playing space. And I think when people look back later, they'll, they'll say, oh, wow, that was really kind of a seminal game in this sort of artistry of designing these things. Um, and there's so many reasons that this is a great game. Um, uh, I've done my research from the man, so I know that he not, he designs his own games. I mean, the layouts and the, how the fonts look, and and that's huge because in the past you might have some guy that wrote the game, and then another guy who comes in and kind of puts it together like how it's going to look in the book. But when the same guy is like you know available and and thinking about both of those sides, that's groundbreaking. Okay, another thing that he does is he. He plays his games. He plays them over and over and, and makes them better and better uh, before they go to publish. 
the game. And that is kind of huge and groundbreaking, believe it or not, because I think that many of the games uh, that we play and some that we enjoy probably weren't play tested quite as much. Uh, but mostly it's just sort of this feeling when you're playing Blades in the Dark uh, and, and some of John's other games that uh, everything has all all the boring parts or the the parts that are kind of hard or kind of uh, clumsy have been sucked out and only the fun. It's like biting into a big peach full of fun and then it dribbles down your chin. Is that? Is that too much? Um, so that's all the preamble I wanted to give uh, for this guy. Uh, and that's just me gushing about Blades, but also so many great uh, experiences that he's given us as gamers um, uh, that that fall right in line with everything I just said about Blades. So without further ado, let's bring him in from, uh, I believe, the Pacific Northwest. Let's welcome John Harper, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, hey, thanks so much for being here. And I hope that wasn't, I, did I embarrass you? Was that too much gushing? That was the exact right amount of smoke. I okay, just, great. Just, mm, perfect. Nailed it. Good. Excellent. <laughs> How are you tonight? I'm doing well. Doing well. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, out here in Seattle and um, on the trail to vaccination land. Oh, yes. Are you, about uh, to, are you about to do number two or number one? Uh, number two is done, and um, so it's 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 just oh. a matter of time now. Um, Wait, today? You, did you get it today? Not two? today. No. Oh, no, thank no, God. No. Yeah, I'm over the over that hump, fortunately. But uh, yeah, I just felt good when yeah. I got number did, two. Yeah, number two didn't really? do any. Yeah, and and like you know, my friends were like, they were all like, oh, I was sick, you know, and I was like, I've eaten Arby's for years. Like, there's no. <laughs> pathogen that you can put in me that is going to put me down you're just perfectly preserved inside your organs are just full of beef right i'm like one of those what was it, that those exhibitions body wars or whatever yeah. where you would go and see the inside of the human body when i die they'll just be able to do that to me without any shellac i think horsey um, sauce is like 80 percent formaldehyde probably so i think it is i think that's good. the it's the it's the horsey sauce it's definitely. just so delicious though i mean oh absolutely mm. Uh, well, John, we're really excited to have you here. And we really like, we mostly just appreciate that, um, you found our little stream and that also you were so kind as to kind of, you know, get involved a little bit and say hello to all of our viewers who are really excited that you're here. Um, and so, um, thank you so, so, so much for being here. That said, my first question is you've said that I'm the perfect blades in the dark GM. Talk about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's, it is true. Um, I, I like, like I was saying briefly before we started the show, um, there are, there are a fair number of Blades, uh, shows on Twitch and, and YouTube and a lot of really good ones. Um, but I don't always have time to actually watch a whole session, um, right. or, or series of, of sessions. Um, I try to watch at least some of every show that pops up that tags me on Twitter or whatever. I like to ch sort of check in and see what they're doing. Um, but something that stands out with your show uh, is the high, high energy level, high pace um, and the sort of drive to get to the good stuff. And like you were saying in the intro, that's really what blades and most of my games try to do is create a structure for the players and the GM to get to that fun stuff quickly. But it does require the other side. It's not just me as the designer building those structures. You have to step up and do that work of kind of pushing the pace and jumping forward, getting into the action, getting high energy and that kind of thing. So right. um, just that when I first saw the, the, the ping on Twitter about the show and I checked it out, I, I watched the whole, the whole thing. And they're short sessions too, which helps. Um, but it was really gratifying to see those mechanisms that are meant to speed up play actually do the work, uh, which does yeah. is not always true. Not everyone has that same engagement with them. Um, yes, Clinton Trucks, you've entered the Clinton Trucks has yeah. entered the chat. I didn't want to let this completely fly by. You said that that was going to be your first question, and we laughed. I didn't think you were going to make him answer it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he knew what I was really asking, Clinton Trucks. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was uh, an excuse for me to talk about the mechanisms anyway. So it's funny. Of course. And so um, so that's uh, that's really interesting. Like, um, I think that tabletop role playing games are like, um, you know, they often have these sort of. Um, uh, well, I would say lack of mechanisms because you, you put rules in that kind of get it moving. And other games have many good uh, rules and mechanics that make them do all kinds of fun things, but often they don't necessarily have uh, mechanics that make the game kind of have pace. And so um, because there are all these granular details, uh, as, as I heard you say, and by the way, if anybody hasn't heard John talk on Craig Shipman's podcast, um, Tabletop Talk, uh, his Insider Insights series. You should go check that out because, as I heard you say on your on, on that show, you know, a lot of game sessions, the first hour, it kind of devolves into everybody talking about how Windows work. Um, <laughs> and I thought that was such a really yeah. funny, um, funny observation. Um, uh, so um, that is interesting, you know, that that idea of kind of getting pace moving and things like that. Um, I think it's partially the the um, tradition of role playing, you know, sometimes being caught up in uh, extremely deadly situations where details matter a lot between the fate of your character, and so you do want to know exactly which way that door swings. Um, so that 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 did create a certain type of play, which is fun to do if you're into that sort of es almost escape room level of of dungeon crawling, nitpicking yeah. every detail, and using your fishing line, and all, all that's really fun to do. But it takes a lot of time, generally. Mm -hmm. um, so and as long as everybody that, knows that's what it is, or, or yeah. as long as maybe uh, that's intended, right? Sometimes it yeah. might not be intended, and that's not optimal. But um, that can yeah. be that can be an issue, yeah. And and also the people that you play with on your show, I think, being performers themselves, comedians and actors and so on, they 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 do have a a sense of that timing of we need to you know, we keep things moving. Don't get bogged down, and that that helps a lot too. That's a that's a player skill that uh, me as a designer, I can I can strain and strive to write the, the exact right word in a book to try to impart that to a player. But at the end of the day, um, having those skillful players to step up and do that is is another thing that makes the show really really fiery. Absolutely, and then you know, uh, not to mention uh, streaming uh, does somewhat help as well because you're kind of aware that you have an audience, and uh, mm -hmm. and our viewers are right there, you know, constantly typing "hurry up" and all cap, <laughs> and is this over yet? You know, just kidding, guys. Um, so uh, let's talk about tone a little bit because um, you know, I, I feel that your games have a really strong tone. Often they are, um, they have a lot of specificity, which I think is great, which kind of adds to that kind of like a mood or a tone. Uh, when you were writing Blades and you kind of wrote it in real time while you were playing it, you were writing it kind of with your players, if I understand correctly. Um, how did the kind of the tone of the world emerge from that or like the, the kind of mood you were going for? Did your players provide a lot of that or did you try to put in things that would kind of ev evoke that or? It was a combination of things. Um, that first group, the the long suffering, very patient playtesting group that I was in, um, played the game for a couple years, uh, almost weekly um, sessions of iteration after iteration. And uh, we're really good sports about it. And and it, it wasn't like it was a big slog. We were having fun, but um, finding the tone was tricky. And our first sort of mini series that we did, it, it started out, you know, the dark haunted streets of the city. And it was that, that the setting was there. Uh, but the events of that first sort of, um, I don't know, 10 session arc or something were they they went to a sort of highish fantasy place. They they were starting to well maybe we can bring the sun back and yeah well you know it it's it started to take on that ramping effect of 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 high fantasy of adventure what kind of what we're used to playing we're all games. used to that um, sure yeah and it felt natural in the process of doing it it didn't feel like we were rushing it or or doing anything wrong in play um, but because we got there so quickly. Um, and we were doing these world shaking things. Um, we, we sort of rebooted and started that play test again, anew with a sort of new root situation, new set of characters, uh, some remade from the previous one and said, okay, let's, what, what caused us to go there? Do we, do we need some sort of breaking 
systems here? Do we need something in the game that's going to remind us that we're climbing up this, the rungs of this ladder right. in this dangerous place? Uh, and so that's where some of the stuff around tier and, and um, those mechanisms came from. But Great, um, yeah. Yeah, it t- um, t- tonally in terms of comedic versus grim, uh, lighthearted or dark, and that I think the game, the trappings of the game tell you one thing about it. It's it's fairly grim. Uh, right. It would not be a fun place to live at all. I think that's why I um, like it. But in terms of play, I think it does leave the some room for the for the people at the table to make have have some fun, make it a little jokey if they want to, and. Um, find space to to have fun with it and not just constantly be sort of in this grind sure uh, so it's it is a, it is a little bit of a dial that each group is gonna turn for themselves um absolutely that kind of dial is important i mean like i i, I find that you know um when i ran earlier um campaigns of say a cthulhu game i wanted it to be so um true to the literature and then mm. it was just kind of a bummer <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. everybody's just kind of dying and going mad. And, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I think that Blades definitely strikes that balance really well between sort of the kind of the grim uh, dystopia, but also uh, you are brave uh, scoundrels, you know, succeeding by the skin of your teeth. So there's some fun. There's a lot of fun to that. In fact, um, when we're talking yeah. about tone. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just thinking today, Vincent Baker, the designer of Apocalypse World, uh, and Meg Baker um, posted, I think it was today, actually, uh, a blog post about Apocalypse World's design and um, touched on genre specifically. And Vincent had an interesting thing to say about this, which is, are you, when you're doing something in a genre or with certain tone, are you kind of a mirror orbiting the the source and trying to reflect its features like i want to i want my cthulhu game to be like the original work right Um, and you're always trying to reflect it back or are you part of the ongoing creation of that genre is this a another work that's being added to the genre uh and i think he he argues that role-playing game tables tables of groups of players and sessions of play are the latter that they're they're new fiction in the genre that can push its boundaries somewhere else or change the tone or move the needle somewhere. Um, and they don't always have to be the first one, which is sort of like, well, that wouldn't happen in a cosmic horror story. We shouldn't do that. Um, no, I, that's, I, I'm not that's saying an that's awesome like, way. That's yeah, an awesome way a, to, to kind of conceive of it, you know, um, uh, and probably a good way, you know, for um, GMs, I think sometimes they do, they can get a little wrapped up in that stuff. Like, hey, they're not hitting the tone I want, you know, and um, it, to be open to kind of the fact that you are creating a new work, right? I mean, yeah. that's a great way to think of it. Um, that said, do you ever ever see a Blades game being played and think, oh, oh, no, this is, <laughs> no, this isn't what I intended. Have you ever, has, it, has that ever happened? Do you kind ever of. have those feelings? Yeah, yeah, sort of, sort of. Um, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything that was uh, wrong. Um, I, I think the game does go to some lengths to say, this is yours, make of it what you will, and yeah. uh, create the thing you want at your own table. Um, but yeah, ev- every now and then there'll be just a, a an off note in the symphony, you know, yeah, that kind of sure. makes me go, mm, I don't know about that one. But but it, that's it's not for me to judge uh, that the i i've done my work <laughs> the author is dead <laughs> you it's yours uh and um so it's, it's 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 less about me being the creator and more just being my own my own uh, maker of blades fiction at my own tables uh, it's not how i would do it at the table but it's not really my designer side thinking oh that's it, that's wrong it is interesting that you you know as a game designer you sort of create a thing um that is by on purpose half finished or half, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, and now you go do it, which is almost, it's almost different from like, you know, you write, you write a book and then people have interpretations, but when people are interpreting a game, they're really, really interpreting it. It's interesting. Yeah. It's, it, it is, it's, it's something I really love about it, uh, about our hobby here, um, being a designer and a, and a player and a GM, um, and all the different ways you're creating stuff, uh, they're all they're all kind of different. Um, yeah, and so you get to stretch all those different creative muscles. 
Um, well, this this reminds me of another question I was going to ask you, actually, because um, you said in uh, one interview I listened to that you, when people hack your game, right, and they make a new game out of it, um, you love that. Yeah, you you yeah. love it when people do that. But yet, John Harper, when they hack your game and make a new game out of it, you don't make any money off of that new game. <laughs> so my yeah. question is, what is wrong with you? <laughs> uh, well, Blaze is doing just fine, so I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I'm not worried about that. But um, it's 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 a tradition in my circle of the hobby. Uh, when I came up as a designer and started making stuff to share. I mean, I started designing when I was like 10, when I first played my first role playing game, like, like a lot of people do, you kind of start that homebrew process right away. Like, what if, what if it worked like this? And what if this is a different rule? And um, so it, there was always that kind of game creation um, thing going on with me. But when I started sharing that, sharing them publicly, um, I was uh, connected with a group of designers um, that we're also doing that, just sort of throwing stuff up on their blogs. Um, there was like share, shareware type games where someone would like mail right. you uh, a, 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 a printout. And you, if you liked it, you could mail them $5 because PayPal didn't exist. Wow. Um, and <laughs> that, that culture was all very supportive and Hey, you know, take, let's share this idea. Let's share that idea. Um, oh, you want to use that system I came up with for firefights or whatever, you can put it in your thing. Um, it was more like a kind of community workshop of design where everyone was was sort of supporting each other's stuff. Um, and without that, I don't think I ever would have taken it more seriously and gone on to, to shift my career out of, uh, you know, doing graphic arts and stuff into, in, in, into being a game designer. So um, I always felt like since I got that opportunity to grab someone else's clay that they had already sort of mo partially molded. Um, it was just part of what I should do to sort of pass that on and, and leave, leave something for other people to, to use um, as, as, as each game kind of, for me as a designer, I'm kind of like moving forward to some degree with each, with each design. But if I leave enough material there, then that though all those things can become their own branches and, um, can be, can be carried further than I was going to do. Uh, so well, I really love that. Um, I love that, uh, you know, that's, that's the attitude that, you know, that you approach it with. And, um, it's just so kind of, um, refreshing, but it also kind of puts me in mind of, you know, I was kind of a nineties a kid too. And, uh, the kind of DIY kind of zine culture. I mean, it's kind of punk rock. Like the idea of like, we're all just like creating crazy art together is really, really, um, lovely and uh i think well, you're being kinda... you're being very generous jared i'm a 70s kid not a 90s kid so uh, oh really we're, i'm we're uh, well, we're a, li but, a little off uh there but, but you but started otherwise... but when did you start d d doing this game design where you were kind of designing them and emailing them back and forth was it was uh, it the 70s it wasn't no that yes i that, that was in the 90s yes it was, it was. yeah yeah that's um, what i thought okay yeah, yeah um yeah. i wish i was a 70s kid i want to be gen x so bad um <laughs> But uh, you know that said, you've given us permission to hack uh, your uh, one of your newer games, Agon, and you even suggest we're gonna we're gonna try at some point. I think we're really gonna try it, John. I I haven't revealed this to you yet. I think we were kind of joking around, or you were joking around with our our good buddy Clinton Trucks on Twitter. But we're thinking about creating a version of Agon, and we're gonna get into the details of Agon in a minute, uh, viewers. But um. We're going to think about doing a vampire version of Agon where you travel uh, through the mist to different islands of horror and you've given us an incredible uh, PlayStation game style title for it. Clinton Trucks, can we see that right now? <laughs> Bloodstroke 2, Sagas of the Raven's Guard. <laughs> um, I want it to be real and so we shall make it so. Somehow we, we will make this so. I think we should. Um, I, I, I already, I have the character sheet is like almost done. Uh, what the character so, sheet for bl for for Bloodstroke is almost done? Yeah, it's getting it's getting there. Uh, obviously, <sighs> the box I, I was able to find the uh, the old box in my in my attic uh, of the uh, basic set of the tabletop version. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, <laughs> Presumably so from the nineties. Uh, well, I, I want to. I it's really cool to um, 
Uh, I think it would be, it's really cool to just maybe design games that way is just come up with the box for the thing you really wish was real and then go from there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think starting with graphic design in general is a good, good, good policy. It, it's an inspiring. It makes you want to make the thing because you've already made a cool piece of art or whatever that sort of justifies itself. Uh, and there's so much of uh, gaming that is sort of user interface. You know, if you're, if you're making the materials you're going to use in play as you, as as you design, uh, then you're always going to keep that in the forefront of your mind. You're not going to just sit with a text document and fill page after page after page right. of material and then not really know what to do with it. If you're slotting everything into the sheet and the rules the players are actually going to use, um, it, I think it helps like build everything for play as opposed to kind of for a book or something. No, it's 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 absolutely true. And this is one of the reasons I think that your games really kind of changed the whole, you know, conversation about how these games should work because it's designed from the ground up as something that should be played, as something that is a, a whole document and not, you know, we hired an artist to plug an illustration that doesn't fit into our wall of text. Yeah. Do you often start um do you often get the seed from a graphic design or does it start more uh, the impression I got from some of your other interviews is that you kind of start with play uh but maybe do you ever use the seed of the graphic design it, they go hand in hand I I generally at the first play test I will have a cool looking set of sheets for the players at that point um but before I've figured out the typeface and the name and the inky stained corner piece on the sheet or whatever, before I've right. done that, I probably am not starting the play test um, because it's, and I, I'm not saying this is the only way to play test at all. Like that you do it any way you want, but for me um, it helps me get excited about it and kind of start to see it, it, whether or not it's going to turn into something that I'm going to want to work on. And also because if we're not playing on, on a virtual tabletop or something, there's nothing else for the players to kind of see to right. inspire them and get their touchstone of what this is supposed to be like. But if I throw down character sheets that look like, you know, the side of a, a painted side of a van with a wizard and a unicorn or whatever, you're going to be like, okay, I, I, I think I know what we're doing. Um, yeah. And that sheet gets people so ex excited if it has the kind of elements you're talking about. Right. And I think yeah. it probably also does a lot to kind of, you know, we were talking about tone earlier, a lot uh, to kind of let them know what kind of experience they're in for or what's expected of them, you know, to whatever extent it is expected. So um, that's a really, really cool way to start. And I'm just kind of really jealous that there's a group of people that just get to uh, sit down with Game Master John Harper putting fully designed <laughs> new character sheets in front of them. Um, it's all fun in games until week four and you're copying your character again onto a new sheet <laughs> because John keeps changing the rules. <laughs> well, uh, they should be lucky. And if they complain, <laughs> tell them there's uh, Clinton trucks and me in line right behind them. Nice. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, so you talked a little bit about the play testing and this iterative kind of way that, you know, you, you kind of make the sheet, you guys play, then uh, you add more rules, you make kind of a new sheet, you play with that, and you keep kind of adding elements to kind of maybe, you know, shore up some places where it's going a little bit where you don't want to go. So um, uh, let's see. So this iterative process, um, uh, was this process the same for your new game, Agon? Because I know that you did that for Blades. Um and uh, then can you tell me like kind of like uh, how the process for Agon was different uh, from Blades? And also we should tell people a little bit about, about what Agon is in case they don't know. And I'll let sure. you do that since you created it. Yeah. So it Agon was a game that I released in uh, 2006 originally. Um, the first time I went to Gen Con, uh, Hey, there's, there's this, th that's the new one. That's the second. That's edition. the new one. And I did notice that yeah. there is like a first edition, right? There is a first edition, uh, which is pretty different. Um, it has the same core uh, premise, which is your uh, ancient heroes in the mo model of Odysseus. Uh, you're trying to make it back home after a, a, a war and you get lost in the mists uh, among these strange islands, the gods, uh, think you're not worthy yet and they want to, to send you off to do their errands 
to these various islands of strife where the people are suffering or monsters are plaguing the land or whatever. Um, and you either uh, appease the gods in your actions or make them angry. And as you go along, you accumulate glory and your name grows in power in legend uh, until you either make it home and we sort of judge your epilogue there or your hero uh, perishes or, or retires during the voyage. Uh, and the strength of their name to judges whether they are remembered in the stars forever or if their name is forgotten in the dust of history. Uh, so it's a sort of rivalry game where you're, there's coopetition, you know, you're sort of right. all banding together as heroes, but you want to be first uh, among equals at, at every turn. Um, and the first game was very competitive. Uh, even among with the GM, it was very like point by kind of playing field. I have this many and you have that many and we're going to sort of duke it out over on, in this gamey kind of way. Uh, and, and people liked it. Uh, there were tournaments at Gen Con with, with trophies and things for a while, which was really fun. Great. Um, but uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's day had passed. It was kind of, you know, this archived game now, but not a lot of people were playing it anymore. And uh, Evil Hat, after we did Blades, they said, you know, we want to do another game with you. What, what should we do? And I think it was Fred Hicks at Evil Hat who suggested maybe we revive Agon and, and do like a modern take on it. So, uh, long story short, a bunch of stuff happened <laughs> after that. Sure. But ultimately, Sean Nittner and I um, came on uh, as co-designers of the second edition and um, really took that concept and re replaced all the, the stuff underneath it, all the systems, uh, created a new leaner, quicker, simpler game um, to still get at the heart of that pursuit of glory and, and legend. Um, and, uh, and, and, and quick play was our main goal. Um, Blades is a game of generally you want sort of a campaign. You want time to sink your teeth into these characters and really get into what makes them tick and get involved in the factions and all this stuff. You say the longer you play kind of the richer it, it gets. So we wanted Agon to be fast two hour, one shot game or one hour, um, do an Island. you sail off into the mists, never to return. And it's, it's Bill Bixby and the Incredible Hulk TV show. You just wander off right. at the end of the thing with the music playing and you, you next week you're in a new, a new place, new, new, new problem. So fast pace, high action um, uh, game is what it was our goal. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about when I say your games have specificity, because like so often, like you get a role playing game as a game master and you're like, wow, I love all the stuff in this. Wait, what do I do with it? Or like, wait, how, what does the end of a session look like? What's the beginning of a session look like? And your games sort of have baked into them. Hey, this is kind of how it would, it'll probably start. Hey, this is kind of probably what's, I mean, with Agon, this is very explicit. This is kind of what'll be going on in the middle. And Hey, this is probably kind of your, you know, where your denouement, or this is kind of how you exit out to the next thing. And um, it's so, it's so pleasant to have that as a game master and and understand the flow because you're letting us know what is the flow of the game, how how it's going to go. That that was another goal, and it it took far into the process. I think your question was about iteration, and and it was yeah. a long process of iteration. Um, so you played this like 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 you did with Blades, like over yeah, and over, adding about, and subtracting. I don't know. I think it was eighteen months or something of playtesting. Um, wow. With various groups and and iteration, 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 and um, part way through, Sean really noticed because uh, he he was running right out of the gate with what we had at the time when we were doing the second edition. So he was the GM, and he had the burden. We 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 were not being nice to the GM in the original uh, version of second edition, and he was just like, "This is too much. I is way too much to keep track of. This is such a pain." Uh, so we we worked on that problem to streamline stuff for the GM. And about halfway through that process, he said, you know, I think if we want to, this could be a first time GM game. We could we could focus on making something that is not just le less troublesome than it was, but like actually like way easier to GM than your average RPG uh, and, you know, figure that out. And I was like, all right, I'll try to boil down how to be a good GM into three pages of text and that, that that won't be a problem. Uh, I'll just work on that for right. two years. Um, but we did, we got it down to this point where we decided to call them the strife player as opposed to the game master because they have right. this very specific role. Uh, you only do three things as the strife player. 
um, you reveal, you ask, you reveal stuff, you ask questions, and you judge outcomes. Um, and then we give you all 12 islands all written up for you. Uh, you don't have to do any prep or make stuff up ahead of time. Um, right. So we're in, in addition to trying to make this fast paced adventure game, if we sort of accidentally discovered we could make maybe a good first time GMing game or a rotating GMing game. Um, and uh, towards the last sort of third of development, that was our main focus to try to get nail that and make something that was not as intimidating to, to run. I really did love that, you know, the game explicitly states like, and then maybe someone else plays the strife player, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, you know, yeah. if you're like, a, a, you know, how many young GMs are sitting there like, and maybe next week my mm -hmm. buddy will do it, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I personally, uh, my, uh, my fanaticism for control means that I want to be the GM <laughs> all the time, but other yeah. people, you know, um, so I, I'm really fascinated and really excited that you've created the, well, first of all, I want to, I just didn't, I, I didn't quite realize how long ago the first edition had been. So what does it feel like to kind of go back to something um, from, you know, what are we talking for 14 years ago and kind of uh, look at it again and, and, and change it. Is that, is there something uh, nice about that or, or, or tough about looking at your old work or how does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, it was, I, I think Fred may have mentioned it as an option because I was telling this anecdote. I was at a convention, um, and uh, one of my friends who was a playtester on the original edition of Agon um, had put it on the schedule that he was running it. And this was, I don't know, 2011 or something. So it had been right. a while. Um, and I thought, wow, I can't believe he's running Agon. Let's, I, I'm going to peek in and see what that's like. And they were having fun. But after about two minutes of watching, I was just cringing. Like, I can't believe I'm making people play it. Like, that is so, it's just so cumbersome. And... Oh boy, it takes so long to explain this stuff. It's just so much like other modern role playing games. <laughs> this thing that I did so many years ago. Uh, it, was, it was hard to watch, and and Wilhelm did a great job, and they had they had fun, and they all shouted their names in glory and stuff, and that was great. But it it did plant a seed that well, it it didn't really plant a seed so much as it made me feel good as a designer. Like, well, I, I've grown since then. I can tell that that's not great, uh, but. Um, Going back to it was, I, I, I sat and read it when we, we decided to do the second edition cover to cover and was just like, I don't know if I can salvage any of this. Um, so we actually, we hired Jason Morningstar, the, the designer of, yes. of Fiasco. I love his and, work, yeah. Uh, Night Witches, which I think is over there. Um, yeah. He's made all, all kinds of great games. Um, and he, he had run much more Agon than I had. Um, it was a staple in, in, for him for a while. So um, we asked him to sort of take what he has done with it and sort of fix it uh, and, and make like what, the version 1.5 um, that would actually be good, uh, which he did. And um, it took us playing that for a while to realize that's not even what we wanted. We didn't want version 1.5. We actually wanted to sweep the decks and start over. Um, and he was extremely gracious about all that and was like, oh, fine. Yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. Uh, he wasn't, he wasn't angry that we were not using his work, but, um, it, it we really needed him that buffer space, uh, An outsider. Me, yeah, just me reading yeah. it again. I couldn't see a way into it. And he was able to do that, that bridge, uh, that let us see, okay, that's, that's not what we want, but this is pointing somewhere where we, we do want to go. Um, well, that's fantastic. I mean, it, it, like th that's what I would say, even just reading, but definitely when I play Blades, but even just reading Agon, um, I haven't gotten a chance to play it yet. You you can feel that it's been played, that mm. someone has played the game. So it's time for a Jared Logan cheeky question. <laughs> Do you think other game companies play their games before they put them out to sell them? Uh, Yeah. It's a I cheeky think... question. <laughs> Yes, I, I mean, I, I, I have not, I have knowledge of, of playtesting happening at, at uh, you know, a certain other Seattle-based game design company, mm -hmm. uh, for, for example. Um, I guess I, I'm I, being cheeky because I think sometimes, well, uh, let's be, I, well, let's be not, really, being on. really generous, I would say. I, I have a, I have a oh, caveat. Oh, go ahead. I, go I, ahead. I, go I, ahead. I did have a caveat. Um, I, I don't think that supplemental material always gets playtested very much. Right. 
Um, I think the core game goes through lots of iterations. It's a big flagship product for them. Hasbro's not going to let them do anything half-assed there. It, 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 not that Wizards would, but or whatever company I'm talking about. Um, but I do think sometimes supplements are more of a work for hire. You know, write the write the product, um, fill in the word count on the dragon hatchlings, and then have the map. And then, you know, it probably gets played a little, but. For me, I've noticed supplements and adventures and stuff like that can sometimes feel like, I don't, if someone had played this, I, I don't know. <laughs> I think they would have seen that this doesn't really add up. Uh, a lot of the games, strange. a lot of the games of, you know, our youth, I feel like some of them di maybe didn't get played at all. Or maybe, maybe it's that, you know, they were so idiosyncratic that perhaps a certain game master had to kind of be at the helm. And, and you know. Yes. I think you, you, you would agree with me maybe that a great game master can make almost anything work. Um, well, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's like having a, a great host or, or, a, a, you know, someone who can host a great party or whatever it, that that's that type of skill is so powerful. It can smooth over all kinds of, all kinds of bumps. Um, and, and for me, and I guess probably for you too, there, there was a, a period there where uh, all of the gaming knowledge was was an oral tradition there were there were books but re reading the book right. didn't really help you much it it told you like what the modifier was for a broadsword if you had a ready to action but like how what do we, what even do i say i mean uh, yeah try, so if you try reading not, an ad and d manual it's uh from like you know the 80s it's kind of indecipherable palimpsest Ooh, it, i use palimpsest wow nicely done one I, i'm sure gary gygax loved that word too uh, um, yeah, but, but because of be not being part of that oral tradition, um, I think if you were, then all of that stuff made sense and you did all the techniques and stuff that everyone knew to do when you played those games. But if you were outside of that or too young to have been included in it, um, yeah, it, it can look like just a bunch of words and did anyone actually play this? Uh, they did, they just didn't transmit what they were doing through the book. The book was sort of a, a reference manual, you know, for the thing, not the thing itself. And that's why, I mean, th this all like, I mean, it connects so well to like what you were just saying about uh, Jason, kind of, you know, you, you were like, you were aware that your older game, you didn't really have kind of a way in. Jason Morningstar plays it in kind of a different idiosyncratic way that helps you kind of get your head around like what the new version is. and. Um, I think that's really interesting, you know, like the way these games were played was not always the way they were intended or the way they were written. Um, yeah. And, and sometimes when I play, <laughs> sometimes when I play some games, I'm like, I don't know if anybody played this, but <laughs> your, your games always feel really kind of like, uh, like a worn, like an old shoe. I mean that in a great way, of course. Um, I, I do feel like it's sort of my responsibility to at least knock off all the obvious uh, problems uh, of the, the, the rust off the thing, so to speak, um, because you're, you're, we're having an, it's commerce, you know, you're, you're giving me your hard earned bucks and like, I don't want to just give you a bunch of words I wrote. I, I want to do some work for you, the, the players, uh, GM, um, to at least take carry it far enough so that it doesn't immediately crash and burn. And there's some kind of guidance based on our experience because often what you think a game's gonna do and play and what it actually does is are pretty different over time. You know, they, it might work once or twice, but third, fourth, fifth session, things start to get weird maybe. And so, um, I, I feel some responsibility as the creator and, and seller of this product to take carry it far enough to see like, okay, it is gonna work. If magically somehow the medium of this book is going to like transmit our experience to you <laughs> out the other end. Well, that's it. I mean, that's just, I, I think that's it shows an incredible amount of integrity, right? Because, um, you know, sometimes these books can just kind of be art objects or, you know, something that someone, I feel like that people just kind of collect them to collect them. And so that they're just sort of the subject, but yours serves that purpose because it's a beautiful thing, but it's also really playable. And, and, and so that's, that's really kind of exciting and fun. Um, I, I want to ask you, because, you know, you kind of mentioned maybe extra source book supplemental material. You feel like maybe sometimes um, that stuff, uh, kind of gets thrown out there your books are kind of 
complete in and of themselves, kind of. I mean, certainly there is supplemental, cool supplemental material out there for Blades, but Blades sort of, you, you have the whole game. You have yeah. you have the campaign setting. You have, in fact, you know, if, if there was something that kind of gave me pause when I first uh, looked at Blades, was that like, wait a second, the NPCs are on their character <laughs> sheet? No, I decide that. I'm God. Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, when I yeah. finally, um, when I finally just kind of uh, let go and let God and and let that happen, and and I realized what you really have done is you've removed, you've left the fun part for me, because the fun part is not necessarily like coming up with a name and what the relationship is. The fun part is playing it and reacting to the players. And so um, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about how how you came to the conclusion, hey, we can kind of do some of this work for the game master and, and and put all these specifics onto the sheet and into the book so that it's not like you don't have to get five books to play this. Um, did, was there a question in there? I think you know what I'm, I'm hinting at here, John. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think there's there's a tradition that stretches all the way back to, to, the, to the seminal games of um, tables of, of stuff uh, for the GM to to use uh, to to not have to invent necessarily the contents of a room or or someone's pockets or uh, the relationship uh, between two NPCs or the reaction role when you meet someone are they hostile are they friendly that that sort of stuff has always been part of the hobby this kind of seeding um, material uh, but when it comes to running a sandbox um, where you are kind of restricted in, in, in location and you're gonna di just dig deeper and deeper and deeper into relationships and factions and everything is sort of set up. Um, whenever I've done that type of thing as a GM, it's just been this huge amount of work uh, because you produce, you, you, you the, the players can turn to you at any time and say, I go down this alleyway and I go talk to this guy, Who who is that guy? Uh, which is fine if they're visiting a town every few sessions or something. But if it's every night, you can just be overwhelmed with hundreds of people. And how do I do it? How do I keep all these plates spinning? And so um, other, other games before me, uh, Stars Without Number, notably, but Kevin yes. Crawford's amazing masterpiece. Um, and, and Apocalypse World, Vincent and Meg, um, are two, two that I've uh, run the most. Um, in that sandboxy way and they both give you all those things they give you lists of names and right. descriptions of stuff and it starts that number even lets you sort of roll some dice and invent a whole planet and its culture and its politics and everything yes uh, right it's really yeah, and amazing. a lot of a lot of apocalypse's world uh, the, its bones are in blades and uh yeah. Yeah. and and so i guess uh, yeah i uh, you're making me realize yeah a lot of that was kind of started there um, the sort of idea of giving the the specifics, you know, that people can use. It's practical uh, be, because you might have to think on your feet a lot, um, and you want to have that that help from the game. Be, because, like, yeah, like, like I think you said in this your interview with Craig, like, um, uh, the fact that I put the NPC names on the character sheets meant you were trapped. Like, you couldn't even like not pretend like <laughs> they didn't exist. The players could be like, "No, I see they're here, and I have them." Uh, but so, I enjoyed yeah. that. I I yeah. really do. I, it, now I enjoy it. It's a way um, of sharing responsibility. Um, your you, you, the GM is playing all those characters and is in charge of that world. But the if the players have those names, you as the GM don't have to. You know, it in sort of old, especially in '90s gaming, there was a lot of talk around like hooks. How do I hook the players? How do yeah. I basically trick them to go on the adventure that I've planned? Um, and a lot of that stuff, if you go back and read it now, is like weird, like not very consensual, like manipulative shit that's really, really right. odd. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and and so most of it's just bad, but but some of it gets weird. Um, and so I'm like, well, and I'm, I'm just sort of copying Kevin and, and Vincent's approach here. But um, if if it's on the player's side... They can. They don't need you to like offer all this stuff. They can look down their sheet and go, "Wait, I know a spirit trafficker. Let's talk. Yes. Let's talk to this guy." Uh, and that li lifts some of the burden um, from the GM's 
constant need to sort of like tr drag the players into what's what's happening, they're gonna um, off make those offers. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and you know, th thank Kevin and uh, and Vincent and all those guys for me when you see them, and thank you uh, for doing that because what I realize when I look at Blades, it's a small, it's a smaller book than a lot of RPG manuals, but it's got all the rules and it's got the whole setting. And even though things are kind of more thumbnail uh, sometimes in the description, I feel like I get more. I get I get more of the campaign setting than in you know say you know book two the world of Thalmador <laughs> or whatever and then I have you know you know columns and columns of the history of Thalmador and I don't know not my players don't care they didn't read that but like you say when the spirit traffickers on the sheet they care it's it's if it's on the sheet it's they can use it yeah and um, and there's a middle ground there. Be, because it's sketchy, it's hard for someone to kind of be the expert, you know, the Wikipedia person yes. at the table that's like, actually, the Knights only have seven members, but yeah. in the eighth, eighth season of the 14th year, they allow a ninth, and like, they know all this esoteric stuff. If you have a bunch of seeds, yeah, someone could say like, well, wait, I think isn't isn't that character said to be this thing? And you're like, oh, right, yeah, that is that. But they um, can't go deeper. They can't pretend uh, that they, they have this this hidden secret knowledge that the other players or the GM don't have. I've, I've, I, I've, oh, I'm speak, I, I put up this comment because it, it does speak to exactly what you're saying. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry, John. People still do that with Blades in the Dark. <laughs> uh, because we had a whole controversy in the stream of blood about whether there are horses. Yeah. And so now yeah. we can finally get the final definitive answer. See, this is why you want to talk to your, your heroes, your, your, the, the, the <laughs> creators you love, not to find out about them, but to ask them specific setting and rules questions. Right. So, John. Yes. Are there horses in Duskfall? Uh, everything... Uh, Definitive about horses and dusk wall is in the book. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. I think you're saying that there's nothing about horses, so there can be horses. Um, as a game master, I'm going to interpret yes. that. Yes. Yes, there can be horses. Ah, that's okay. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> there can be horses. Um <laughs> Look, a lot of people have sort of like a friendly relationship with their audience, and I'm just constantly in a conflict with them. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, no, but that, I, that, honestly, that's a great question. Uh, and and it, it speaks to the topic we were talking about before, where uh, it is, it's your thing to make. Um, the fact that goats pull carriages, it that do, that's going to plant something in the group, right? It's, it's going to say, people are going to say, there are, must not be any horses. And, and then now your setting is going to go in that direction. Um, or they're going to say, well, they must be really rare, maybe, and only the extremely wealthy people can can keep horses. Or maybe something about them changed uh, after the gates of death were sundered. Maybe horse ghosts are like human ghosts, and they they got all weird. You know, whatever. You 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 start to go down that road. Um. <laughs> Wait, what? I, I like I said, it's everything I had to say is in the book. Um. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> I but, can just imagine you, John, just like for days, like <laughs> going over that little passage, like, should this go in? People are going <laughs> to want horses. Uh, I'm putting it in. Uh, well, uh, thank, thank you, Clinton Trucks, for uh, citing name and page number. That's that's what Clint helps me with a lot. Um, the, old, the old control F could get it out of a lot of, lot of binds. Yeah. Um, uh, and thank you for allowing for horses. Um, <laughs> but I think your horse ghost idea you just had is the coolest. And maybe we'll do something with that. Um, that was off the cuff. I don't know what I don't know what that was. No, it's I think it's good. Um, now you've also written one page games like Lasers and Feelings. Um, what interests you, or what do you like about a one page game compared to you know some of the games we've been talking about? Um, I think so. Uh, I, I started out um, as a as a hobbyist uh, when I was still sort of working my old in my old career, um, and uh, there was a group of people in in that design space on a forum called Story Games, which was this really prolific uh, forum for players and designers. 
which is sadly no longer around, but um, the community of designers there uh, mostly had day jobs um, and were doing these sort of sketches at, of their games. Like, well, it could be like this, you know, what's, what's the minimum amount of material I can put out on a weekend before I got to go back to work on Monday to sort of suggest a game idea. And after that happened a few times, people started thinking, well, maybe this could be like sort of finished this, maybe I could have enough stuff here in this little sketch where you could, you could, someone else could play it and it would be workable as a, as a mini game. Um, and Graham Walmsley, especially, uh, I UK. love Graham Walmsley. I've never yeah. met him, but I've read it, uh, all of you know the very smart things he's written about game play mastering. Unsafe. I, I recommend Play Unsafe to everyone. If you know a game or yes. play, play Unsafe for Christmas or whatever, um, it is probably the best book to read if you're a gamer, period. Um, uh, I agree. It's amazing. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, but he, he wrote this little mini game called Cthulhu Dark, uh, which was hugely influential on a lot of designers uh, and on Blaze, actually. Uh it took me a long time after Blades was published to remember that I, that it had even been an influence. But um, so he and Jason Morningstar and some other people um, were doing mini games and stuff, and we ended up doing sort of contests. You know, who can write this like two hundred word uh, game or a single page or those kind of things. It became a became a a way to sort of motivate the nano ish kind of uh, motivator for for designers. Um, and everyone was putting them up on their sites for as free downloads and just messing around with them. And uh, Lady Blackbird, it wasn't a one page game, but it was the game mini game of mine that kind of took hold and right. people started playing it a lot. And um, it was sort of my way into starting to have an audience in the indie uh, game space. Um, so mini games had always been my kind of bread and butter as a designer in that circle of of the internet um but lasers and feelings for whatever reason uh i i did it to help out the double clicks this band that i love um they were coming to pax and they were going to sell dice at their at their booth and i thought well it'd be cool if they could give away a little page you know a game yeah. with, when they're selling their dice uh so i wrote it up that friday and printed them out and took them to the pax and <laughs> put, put them on the table there where they're at, at band camp um, but it just, for whatever reason, it got, I think mostly because of Tempting Fate, the Twitch uh, show, Rick Bud's show, because they've, I think they've played now like almost a hundred different versions of Lasers and Feelings or something. They, it's it's crazy. It's great. They played so That's many great. hacks. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you kind of worked it up for the double clicks to kind of like let them have something at PAX. I mean, that's yeah. what a cool, what a cool thing to do, but also like, um, you know, it's it's a popular game, and it's, people love that game, and it does hilariously, uh, but accurately, boil down one of our favorite all time franchises to exactly what it's about. <laughs> it um, does. It does. So, um, so uh, you're a big Star Trek fan, yeah? Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah. Uh, I I was obsessed with it as a kid. Um, it had just gone into syndication, and so it was on like almost every night, and. Um, I watched it every night. Was obsessed with Kirk and Spock and McCoy. And, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. original. Are you an original series guy? Yeah, that's that's yeah. me. I love original series. I totally am. But I love Next Gen. I love Deep Space Nine. Yeah. I, 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 it's all good. I haven't gotten into the new the newest stuff. It kind of yeah it for me. But um, yeah, I love Star Trek, and I think the format. I mean, again, it's it's that Agon kind of thing, like. Yeah. It, episodic every week, new planet, new problem, you deal with it, fly off, do something else the next week. Um, it's so good for gaming. It's a, it's a, it's a team based structure. Everyone has yes, their goal. Which not a lot um, of the fiction that, that games try to uh, emulate or take their cue from are team based, right? Yeah. A lot of stuff um, is that solo protagonist and uh, yeah, Trek is like so good for, for gaming. 
let's talk about Agon a little more. Um, uh, God, I can't believe we've already talked for an hour. I mean, I, I really wish uh, I could talk to you for five hours because there are so many things that uh, we would like to touch on. But let's talk about Agon a little bit. So um, what, what are some of your, I mean, they're pretty obvious, but then maybe uh, you could tell me, like, what are some of your favorite myths or uh, something that particularly might have been an unexpected inspiration for Agon? Um uh, or maybe even films or, or novels that kind of went into the uh, creation of Agon. Yeah, uh, it was obviously starting out was the Odyssey was the main driving force there and the Iliad to some degree. Um, but as we got into the second edition, uh, Sean and I are very big fans of a modern myth, mythic franchise, um, the Fast and the Furious. Uh, <laughs> All and right. As we started doing our playtests, it became really obvious that our characters were doing the types of things that Dom and Letty do, uh, you know, jumping from off a tank through a windshield and uh, the, the type of action and, the, and also the sort of grandiosity of them as, as these mythic figures. Um, there, there's a scene in, I think it's Fast Five, where Dom gets shot in the chest and just kind of looks annoyed by what's happened. You know, he's kind of just like, come on. Uh, yeah. And it, 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 it's a great touchstone um, for modern readers and modern players who maybe not are super into the, the deep uh, mythic stuff. And, and again, there's a room there for that annoying player. We mentioned this in the book, the, you don't want the the sort of historian at the table who's like, well, actually, they wouldn't have done that. So we wanted Agon to be mostly Xena and and with a, a dash of of the Fast and the Furious. To sort it of makes so much it sense from... when I re when I reconceptualize the Fast and Furious, they're all demigods. Yeah, that's yeah. why they're always going family because their <laughs> parents are gods. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It they're, makes they're... so much sense. They're, oh they're capable of these crazy superhuman feats. Um, after the f you know, third movie on, I guess, roughly, um, they just start to care less and less about physics and plausibility. <laughs> and that's, that's what we want. We want that feeling at the table. Of, we don't want the player to hesitate and go, well, if I jump off the cliff, I mean, it's like hundreds of feet down onto the Hydra. Should I try that? That seems dangerous. No, 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 no. We, we, we want the no hesitation whatsoever. Right. It's, it's, you ain't just, playing yeah. GURPS, buddy. You can jump. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, that's fantastic. And what a really, uh, really nice touchstone, you know, because uh, like you say, you, you know, you, uh, people sit down, you can't be like, okay, who has read the Iliad to completion? <laughs> but everybody's seen those films and that'll give them like such a very clear idea, you know. Um, so the clarity of, of your games is just so amazing. Now, I, I, Agon has a new a new iteration and uh, a new a new form. It's taken yeah. a new form. Well, um, let's yeah. talk about that. Speaking of touchstones, that the one I didn't mention, uh, which is true for the for Agon, uh, but especially true for this announcement that I'm going to make tonight on the show, um, Evil Hat and I have with the the ink is dry on the contract. We're doing a supplement for Agon, um, and it's the natural. I feel the natural progression, which is hinted at at the end of Agon. If you look at the final island, uh, Caconia. Um, it involves the god Chaos and perhaps the far reaches of the cosmos beyond the mortal plane. Uh, so Thor Ragnarok is a perfect touchstone for Agon in general, but especially for this new supplement that we're writing, which is far down the road. I've been working on it for a while, doing the art and the writing for it. Um, it's called Agon Realms of Chaos. And uh, it basically takes your heroes of Agon and hurls them into the cosmos. Uh, you fly on Quicksilver sails and throw javelins of radiance, uh, visit different planets and realms, and and uh, do do all the business of of heroic Agon, but on the, in the cosmic uh, at the cosmic scale. Very much based on Thor, Ragnarok, Jack Kirby's uh, comics, The Eternals. Um, the new gods, all that kind of stuff. A little Stargate Atlantis too thrown in there. You've got that uh, home base kind of thing, right? Yeah, on. traveling through the world, and um, yeah. that's so goddamn cool because no one has. Well, I, I'm uh, maybe I'm speaking too blankety, but I don't. I can't think of someone who's done cosmic 
adventure yet uh effectively maybe in a role-playing game that that sort of place where the silver surfer and the in-betweener and four yes. all kind of meet up so yeah. what a really really exciting uh idea yeah I, i'm so stoked for it i i that was my favorite growing up thor, the thor, old thor comics the way the way that fantasy was made into this sort of magical technology everything was was cosmic but there was like right. weird machines and yeah uh, those kirby machines yeah. yeah it was just so cool and then seeing what taika and the and the team did to bring that onto the screen it was so gratifying to see all that uh and especially now they're doing eternals and stuff it's even cooler with with yeah. one of your uh, buddies i think yeah um, yeah kumail my buddy yeah, kumail yeah. is an inter in eternals yeah That's super cool super cool um uh, but it's in the zeitgeist and it's something i've always wanted to do and agon is just such a for me as a player and a GM, it's, it's a fun vehicle for that because you, you, it gives you even more permission. Uh, y yes, you can say that you fall into the heart of the volcano and slay the beast in Agon, but now you can, you can hurl yourself into space and ca capture the heart of a dying star in your hammer and do all that kind of stuff. Holy shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. well, I'm excited. And, uh, I mean, can we show it one more time? Clinton trucks. It's so beautiful. And John has done this art. I mean, these colors, like, you know, what, what a cool little book to like, kind of, it still has like the, you know, the recognizable, very recognizable sort of symbol on the front, but then, uh, these beautiful colors and you can tell it's a whole different thing. Can we see the guy with the glowing horns there? That I, was so I, I'm cool. trying, I'm trying hard not to just entirely rip off Jack Kirby, but if I can do 1%, I'll take it. <laughs> well, I mean, you know what? Has there been a Jack Kirby game like this? There has not. And uh, boy, if you're going to, you know what they, I think you've probably heard if you're going to rip off, you got to rip off the best, right? And, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, he, so beautiful. He's the king. <laughs> you know, I, I have had so much uh, fun um, uh, talking to you, but I think if you don't mind, we'll, we'll throw it open maybe to um, some viewers now, if, if that's cool with you, John. Is that cool? Totally cool. Yeah, yeah. All right. So if people have a question uh, for John, keep it clean. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can go ahead and throw, throw them out there. And uh, Clinton Trucks, you can hop back in if you'd like. Uh, Clinton. Clint, I bet you, do you have a question or do you, did you have just something you wanted to say, buddy? Anything like that? Oh, you know, I was just sitting here biting my knuckles, trying not to I jump know. in. I um, know. I, what do you uh, got, Clint? Go, what do you got? Well, uh, going way, way back, actually. Oh, I'm, I only ask silly questions like, what home game are you playing right now? All oh, right. Yeah. Uh, so, obviously, Pandemic um, was Legacy? It? <laughs> yeah <laughs> well you know no, no joke uh, me and some friends were playing pandemic legacy when the pandemic started and we had just wow. lost a month oh no <laughs> and we were like is the game becoming real <laughs> but it wasn't it was wow. it was a jumanji situation we don't think that we can finish it now though we don't think we can finish it that's dark uh, yeah, it was dark. It was dark at the time, but look, it all turned out fine, and the world is on sure. a ladder to progress that never oh, yeah. ends, and there's nothing to be afraid of. No, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to take us there. Uh, no, I, I think I don't think you did, but um, <laughs> my light fun was, question was hijacked. <laughs> have you played anything fun lately, I think was the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I was running Apocalypse World, uh, two different Apocalypse World campaigns during during the lockdown. Um, one in an alternate setting that I love to do with Apocalypse World, which is sort of a uh, the a alien universe, more or less. Uh, you know, the colonial uh, expanse, um, isolated worlds that are being terraformed and kind of left to their own devices by cruel corporate overlords, and you got to make the best of it. Um, they discovered the horrible crystalline entity that uh, was a big problem for them on that planet. Um, that was a good time. Uh, I, did, I ran another Apocalypse World series, which was uh, the, our wet apocalypse um, in Louisiana and a bayou um, with mangrove trees and giant alligators and a uh, strange thing in the water that made you see stuff that wasn't there. And um, that was that was really fun. We, we hit a really interesting kind of cliffhanger uh in that series when a character sort of apparated uh which <laughs> couldn't easily be explained and we haven't played since so we don't know what happened there 
Um, yeah. But well, I, for I the mean, first time, I, I started playing uh, my my regular group. I have this old, old, uh, our Wednesday night group of people, which are amazing um, game designers. Paul Riddle, who wrote Undying, the very best yeah. vampire RPG there is. Um, and Sage Latora is in that group, Shannon Riddle. Um, we've done a, tons of playtesting together. We're this old, grizzled veteran game group that just knows everybody's, you know, stuff. We can push and pull and do all that gritty work together at the table but playing online we kind of discovered we wanted something especially given the circumstances of the world we wanted something more lighthearted, perhaps fun uh breezy so i ran uh monster of the week for the first time which i'd never played or run before um it's a apocalypse pbta game yeah. um right for people who don't know uh it, where it's you sort of traveling kind of scooby-doo if you want uh mystery solving uh monster fighting people um, and man, it was great fun. We just totally dove into it and we, I got the Tome of Mysteries from Evil Hat, which has a bunch of like pre-made, uh, mysteries, Agon Island style sort of. Uh, and we just popped through a bunch of them and had a grand old time. Um, it was, it was really lighthearted and fun. And uh, yeah, we still did get into some like gnarly family history stuff and all that stuff we love to do. But, um, uh, yeah, it's, I guess it's been like all, all PBTA for me this this uh, last year or so. Well, there's no shortage of options in PBTA. Yeah, right now. yeah, yeah. It's it's like an old pair of shoes, like you were saying before, Jared. Like it, it's well worn. It's the game I've run and played the most of anything. And so when when we want to have that sort of like comfort blanket uh, of a game, it's it's a good go to. Uh, yeah. No, I mean that's great. I mean, I I find you know um, having GM'd a couple different things. You know, jamming something ten times, you suddenly that's when you kind of start learning how to play it. And then jamming mm -hmm. something fifty times, well then you kind of really actually know how to play it. And you still yeah. continually learn things and you know. Um, here we go. What was the yeah. coolest faction that got cut from the dusk duskfall setting during playtesting? Oh boy. That's a tough question. Um, a bunch of them got cut. Uh, I realized that having like 120 factions was going to be a problem. <laughs> um, Release the hidden factions, John. <laughs> when there were 120, how many of them came from play? Like, uh, pretty much all of them. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's it's the it, you know the the way that the book t talks about it is kind of what we did, where you only a few of them are in the player's orbit, and the others are kind of they're there, but they don't really see a lot of screen time. Uh, sure. So the ones that we encountered the most are the ones that tended to survive into, into the book. Um, they got full write-ups, basically. Yeah, basically. And a couple of them are coming, and I, I, I mean, I could tease, slightly tease more supplements. Ooh, uh, but it, tease, it, tease. Blades, blade supplements are being worked on. I, we, I can't say more than that. I know that's frustrating, but we haven't actually, like... You know, got everything signed off, but we are working on blade stuff. Um, that uh, is maybe something more in Duskwall, and maybe stuff that isn't in Duskwall. Um, so that's that's really exciting. That's some really of those will come back around, and um, one of them is oh, one of them that got cut, but is still in the book. Actually, two of them. Um, the uh, if you go into the chapter about special abilities and permissions. Um, you can become like bound to uh, like allow an elder God into your mind uh, and stuff happens when you do that. Um, there used to be a uh, faction specifically about that stuff. They were like sort of a meta cult over all the forgotten gods cults. They were sort of the like equivalent okay. of the church of ecstasy. They were like the, the shadowy uh, Catholics, <laughs> um, right? And I decided it would be cooler if all the all the uh, cults were just on their own and didn't have any sort of higher organization to call on. They were just sort of scattered. Um, so they got cut, but their abilities got put in there. And then the Death Seeker Crows were a faction. Um, just the crows. Yeah, yeah. They wait, wait, wait. Oh my god, did I read? It? Do I get the book wrong? I I've been playing them as birds. Yeah, there are birds. They are. Oh, yeah, thank yeah. God. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were just revealing to me that something that was definitely written as like a group no. of people 
No, they, I've they been are... just like, I guess they're birds. They're called the it crows. said crows. I assumed. Yeah, I skimmed it. I skimmed it, guys. Let's play. <laughs> no, we have a, uh, a million good questions from fans, but now I have another one. I'm going to jump in because that's my right. Yeah, do it. So, uh, the Blades in the Dark setting is like an extended epilogue of a high high fantasy game that you ran for players. Mm-hmm. Dungeon World, right? Right. Yeah, it started with right. Moldvay D and D. Uh, and then went into uh, World of Dungeons, my sort of PBTA hack of of OSR stuff. And then Sage was playtesting Dungeon World at the time, so I I used that group to to playtest Dungeon World. So yeah. I, clearly, a lot of the flavor elements of Blades in the Dark came from the players in the that Blades in the Dark group. How much of the sort of the the base code of that came from the fantasy game like yeah obviously kotar came from the <laughs> older game right kotar. how much has drifted its way through aeons of time and dark magic into this book yeah K- kotar was definitely a factor in that original dnd game um uh lord skurlock was around Ooh. Um, dope uh actually the first He's going through a breakup in our game. <laughs> yeah, it's not He's going a, bad, a bad breakup. <laughs> I didn't know that would be happening until uh, our friend Jasmine Bilar started playing. <laughs> well, I mean, I would highly recommend uh, to go track down Jasmine's um, run of Blades in the Dark uh, on Twitch. It's fantastic. Her portrayal of Lord Skurlock is wonderful. <laughs> yeah. P- ar- arguably the best one. No offense, Jared. No, um, no, none taken. It's- it's really hilarious, and she takes it to a really comedic place. And I love that she's sort of infected your game with the somewhat comedic Lord Skurlock, and you and you've stepped up to the plate and and brought brought out this. Oh, it's it's so it's so good. No, I but love this version. The first so Skurlock comes from um, the Lady Blackbird uh, setting and, and game stuff, um, and a Warhammer fantasy series that I ran for for the Wednesday guys. Um, and he was an important character and all that. And I always just like to have as a GM in a sandboxy thing, it's good to have that like scary person that's just around. And so you, it like makes, it makes things serious all of a sudden when you go, well, this guy is going to be there and everyone goes, Oh crap. Um, so I just like the name. And so I kept using him and in our first D and D session at the office, and for Moldvay, I I was like going to the one page dungeon contest and like hitting random and printing out a thing and and running it, and um, it, it happened to be a vampire uh, lair. And at the end, the dude came out and they fought him and stuff. And in my mind, that was always Lord Skurlock. So I was like, well, how does Lord? Is there a metaverse? You know, is like is the Lord <laughs> Skurlock and Lady Blackbird the same? Which he is. Uh, as the one in Blades and you know, how they all connect. And uh, so th- throughout the D&D game, um, he he was an ongoing threat. And then when we played um, Ghost Lines, which was sort of this bridging game um, after the D&D world was destroyed, but before Blades came into existence, we played Ghost Lines. Um, it's a free game on my blog if you want to go check it out. But uh, blog, my website, I don't really have a blog anymore. Uh <laughs> You you play the the rail jacks who like ride the rails of the Imperium and fight ghosts off the train cars and stuff, um, and in that game you had sort of a downtime uh, phase that was supposed to be just two rolls and no scene work uh, and back onto the train and the players spent like most of the sessions like doing their downtime like it says I can like do criminal work I want to like rob a bank and so <laughs> I was like okay maybe the game should be about this instead of the train stuff um but Bajo well, Ba's, that downtime is amazing yeah I'm sorry go ahead Bajo Ba's the the leader of the Lamp Blacks the criminal yeah. mastermind he he came about because of the Ghost Lines game so we sort of have like Kotar all the way back Skurlock in the middle and Bajo as the sort of la- later edition before Blades took off. Does, am I answering the question? Is that, no, that, yes, absolutely. you are. Like, and, and, yeah. 
Um, I, I'm going to hit a couple more of these these viewer questions. Uh, that was uh, that was. It's really amazing to just see you know the pedigree of these characters moving through different worlds. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put this one up here because I just always love to hear from people who are such talented game masters. Um, oh wait, that's not the one I wanted. I wanted this one. Um, sorry, Miss. Yeah, Miss M. Y. K. We'll get. Oh. Well, maybe we'll get to yours in a minute. Um, <laughs> okay, quite, we'll uh, and it's, I'm, uh, me and Clint are going to answer this because you could get on the Discord and ask us this, and I will pontificate for hours. But uh, important advice for a new GM to give a satisfying experience. And uh, yeah. Elliot L, I'm going to be listening carefully here too. Uh, so I don't want to dodge your question, but I do feel like I, I want to kind of interrogate it a little bit because I think there's a hidden assumption there that a lot of basically every GM has that I still have. Um, I, I, I got, I got nervous running monster of the week recently after all these years. Um, and the, the assumption that I think is something to sort of think about and question is is it your job as the GM to give the players a satisfying experience? Um, and I would argue that it's not. Uh, and that's a weird thing to say, given the history of role playing hobby. Um, generally, the GM is the host, the person who's making taking care of everybody who's supposed to like sort of be the person doing that. Um, for me, my gaming got a lot better overall. And this happened to me in junior high, a little before that, actually, um, because of certain players that I played with. Um, my gaming got a lot better when I kind of shifted my mind to, I'm here to be entertained by the players. And not, not that I don't have any responsibilities or I'm just going to sit there and stare at them and be like, okay, now what? I still want to bring my play to the game as a co-player in our shared uh, hobby. But if I think of, oh my, I can't wait to see what Chris does tonight. I can't wait to see what Allison does tonight. Like <laughs> if I come to game night with that mentality and they and the players like understand that and they're like, okay, oh, I'm going to bring it so much. My character, I'm going to fucking drive a stake through the heart of this game tonight. If that's the group dynamic, the GM job just changes so much. And it's it's so much fun to show up and be like, oh, what are you guys going to do? This is going to be the best. <laughs> um, that coupled with, for me as a GM, I try to focus on playing characters as my main job. So if I want a, a, a beat where like the players uh, are, oh, it would be cool if they had to make a tough call between their loyalty to this group and the this other group's like offer of money or something. Um, instead of thinking like, how can I arrange that as a, as a director, uh, choosing shots and editing film and doing that. If I think of it as, well, I'll have, I'll have a scene with Bajo and he'll, uh, he'll just tell them I'll play, I'll play the, this character and the character has interests and the character has capabilities and the character has a history. I don't have to think about how to get them to point B. I just have to play the guy and he'll say stuff, he'll have opinions, he'll he'll hate this, he'll love that, he'll listen to this guy, he won't listen to that guy. And all of a sudden, all of those management jobs as the sort of puppeteer just disappear and you're just playing this guy. And those surprising collisions happen where I didn't plan for them to break their promise to the Red Sashes. I just played Bajo and I just said what he would say. Uh, so those two things together it made my GMing life a thousand times better. <laughs> um, show up to be entertained and and play your NPCs. That's that's. I mean, what I mean. That's the best answer. As Aaron Urist just commented, that's such a great answer and uh, something that uh, you can even forget if maybe you've learned it. So mm -hmm. thank you uh, for that. It still happens um, to me after after a game, but right before the game starts, I'm ner I'm like, oh god, did I plan? Did I do the right things? And then five minutes into the session, I'm like, oh, right. There are four people in this group. It's, well, it's, it's tough fine. because like, fine. yeah, no, it's tough. <laughs> Weirdly, RPGs are this thing where you're kind of like, you have to remind yourself not to plan a little yeah. bit. And yeah. uh, that's, that's, that's weirdly tough. I don't know why. Um, okay. So this is just to kind of uh, shout out to some of those. I mean, because there, there's been so many things built off of uh, blades in your sort of forge system, which forge yeah. in the dark, James, have you really enjoyed seeing how the designer changed the system? 
Wow. Uh, this is, that's hard to answer. Um, there are so many good ones. Uh, Based on your recommendation, I'm obsessed with Copperhead Road right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cop Cop uh, Copperhead County. Um, Copperhead County. I'm sorry. Yeah, the yeah, song yeah. Copperhead Road. Got my yeah. Head, Jason sorry. Ely's game. It's, yeah. uh, it's so good. It's, it's this, the Breaking Bad, the, the Justified. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It's so good. He, he definitely is doing that work that's sometimes hard to do where he moves the game over a little. It's still sure. crime. It's still, you know, you've right. got time, you got stuff, but he understands that for doing something like Justified or, or Breaking Bad, it does need to change. You can't just sort of change the words. And his changes are so smart. They're just yeah. like right in that space of being very clever. You change um, the accent and the humidity and everything feels different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. I love Copperhead County's great slug blaster, which just came out is super cool. It's like Wait. 90s uh, hoverboard kids that like can go. They figured out, figured out how to open dimensional portals and all the parents are like slug. No slug blasting around here. It's, da <laughs> it's too dangerous. And the kids are like, fuck you, mom. And they like ride their hoverboards and. <laughs> go and, and blast monsters in this other dimension and, and make money and stuff. Um, it's like, it's like the cool uh, kids hanging out in the parking lot game with, with magic and fighting. But that game takes blades for, for people who find blades kind of um, heavy as a game system. Um, Slug blaster is really, really slim and, and simple. Uh, and it's got the same core, but it, everything is stripped down to this really tight, um, form and in the same space, Ali Bushkin's game um, uh, Heist um, is is another great example uh, um, where it it it's the same again. It's like well, you're pulling scores, you're doing heist like Ocean's Eleven. Doesn't Blades already do that? Yes, but this game does it as a one shot. It's like twenty pages long. It gets it just gets it going. It's super fast and clean. Um, super super cool. Uh, but there's so many, uh, go, uh, go to itch.io, put in FITD or Forge in the Dark, and you'll get like Songs from the Dusk and Beam Saber, which is the mecha game, which is fucking awesome. And there's so many in there, all, all, almost all, all the coolest of the cool kids in the Forged community uh, have Mothlight, Justin's game, Mothlight is amazing. I could go on and on. It's, it's, there's no, two. I mean... <laughs> you know, every time I'm on a forum, I see people like, I'm looking for a mecha game. I'm looking for a crime game, but modern, but it needs to not have this. Guys, there is a forged, there's a forged in the dark game for that. So uh, do as John says, go to itch.io and find it uh, and yeah. play these games because the the bones are strong. Um, not not to mention the published games. I, I didn't even say Band of Blades, and sure. Scum right. of Blades which are both yes. great. And Girl by Moonlight, which will be coming out uh, from Evil Hat, the the magical girl Sailor Moon uh, Forge in the Dark game, which is beautiful. Scum and Villainy, which is uh, what you wanted to play when you uh, went to play Star Wars. Uh, yeah, you, you got to do yeah. Scum and Villainy. Um, and I will say about uh, a magical girl game. Uh, over a year ago, Ashley Birch asked us to run her a magical girl anime game. Nice. We want it on the channel. We're not the people to run it. Chat, find us the best game master for a magical girl game. Wait, I can run Please. magical girl. I'm a huge fan of magical girl anime. I, I know you are, but you're going to insist on dressing up. And I think it's important. <laughs> <a poor> taste. <laughs> um, Maybe you can get Andrew to run it. Uh, the designer, they're they're amazing GM, so that would be cool. Yeah. Let's hit. I would run it, but much like in an anime, when I get super horny, I get a nosebleed. It's, I think <laughs> it's a problem. Um, Demonetized. Yeah. <laughs> this has been so incredible. I think, uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, we have to bring it to a close. Uh, John, thank you so, so much for taking the time and for having such great, like, well thought out answers and just kind of uh, telling us about you for an hour and a half here. It's been awesome. It's it's my pleasure, honestly. I'm a big fan of Stream of Blood, and uh, it's it, it can continue doing your great work. I will I will tune in and keep watching. And uh, anytime anytime you want to, may, maybe for a Bloodstroke two sagas of the Ravens Guard. That's we'll, what I'd we'll, like for you to tune in for. We'll do some gaming. Uh, I think we should do it. I think we should do it. I think I you know let's make some time and let's let's figure out what the Ravens Guard is and what is a Bloodstroke and why yeah. are there two of them. 
Um, guys, let's give uh, Mr. John Harper a digital round of applause. Um, uh, you can find John's games anywhere they sell games, but in particular, go and check out what Evil Hat has to offer because in addition to John's games, they make so many great things and they're made by people who truly care about role-playing games uh, and uh, and the, the people that play them. So check out Evil Hat, and uh, and like he said, go and look at all the Forge in the Dark stuff uh, that's out there. Um, and find John's old games, Lady Blackbird. Uh, th- those are out there for purchase, too, I'm sure. John, uh, thanks again, man, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk to you again soon, dude. Yep. All right. Uh, I'll say goodbye for now. And, uh, guys, that was our taste of blood for tonight. I thank you guys so much for being here. I wish we could have stayed and talked all night, but unfortunately I have to go have this baby thing. So, um, I love you guys. Um, remember to subscribe if you haven't already, or hit the subscribe button to send somebody else a subscription. Um, uh, we are dark this weekend because, uh, a child is being born, but we will be back on Tuesday with Andrew Orvidal running a game of Valley Heat. He is uh, our our first interim uh, game master, so come back uh, for that. That's 7 p.m. Uh, one week from now, 7 p.m. Pacific. And uh, I want to thank Clinton Trucks and Brian Baldinger, my partners and producers. I want to thank Megan Arch, our social media manager. I want to thank Jill Petrachek, who made that cool intro you saw. And I want to thank you guys, the viewers, uh, for making this such a great community and coming out in force to talk to John. Um, we'll do more. Uh, we'll do more tastes of blood like this. Uh, and uh, and next time I'll leave a little bit more room for your questions. But thank you guys for being here. Until next time, happy gaming, you sons of bitches. Bye-bye.